My name is David Silverman, and I've been uh, on The Simpsons since its very beginning, uh, 28 years ago, when we started on The Tracy Ullman Show. It was uh, myself and Wes Archer, uh, and originally Bill Kopp uh, animating on The Tracy Ullman Show, and then it was just myself and Wes. When it became a series, two years later in 89, Wes and I became directors. I became supervising director after doing five episodes in the first season. Second season, uh, we did five episodes each, uh, including Rich Moore and uh, Mark Kirkland and, uh, and uh, Jim Reardon. And then I was full-time supervising director on Simpsons and then took a little break to go to uh, DreamWorks and Pixar, Monsters, Inc., also Road to El Dorado, and uh, worked on Ice Age, got back to The Simpsons, supervising director again, uh, directed the movie, directed the short, came here. I think we've all been asked that. Uh, none of us really know. We're very grateful, and we're very grateful that there's appeal in uh, the United States and worldwide, and uh, it, um, it keeps going. I suspect part of it is a little bit of everything. You know, it's the way the characters look. It's the whole, uh, it's the color palette. It's the voices. It's the writing. And I possibly, uh, one thing I always thought is that not only the, the characters relate together as a family unit and you, or you're rooting for them because they're likable, but the, uh, the humor is sort of based on observations of what's happening, you know, currently. So, so that means the, the uh, humor is derived by what's happening in the present day. So I guess in some ways, maybe that's why the humor stays relevant to everybody because it's, it, 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 it has that connection, observation on what's going on. And it's not that we're 100% uh, topical per se. Uh, you know, we have things that, that relate to what's going on. But um, uh, we, we connect in that respect so it stays current. And then we also relate back to what the characters are going through and, and how they relate to each other. When you think about it, if you look at Matt Groening's uh, Life in Hell comic strip back from the beginning, you realize that Matt had this sort of topical uh, parody that he was, you know, and all his character, even his his characters in Life in Hell, the uh, the rabbit characters, it was always relating to, uh, you know, just because it was like living in L.A., right? So it was just sort of day to day living and dealing with day to day living and modern problems and so forth. So I think that's part of the core of what uh, is in The Simpsons, you know, with the starting from that jumping off point, uh, and we were sort of exploring a little bit of that in the, in the shorts, but, uh, you know, uh, it got more involved when it became a half hour, and you had uh, Jim Brooks more involved, and you had Sam Simon more involved, and uh, it expanded from that. So that's, I think it took from that, that core kernel of, 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 of approach, and then uh, the creativity of Jim Brooks and Sam Simon uh, you know, on top of that, expanded the universe, I think. The first script that I got to direct was called Bart the Genius. And I just had never read anything that funny for animation. And I mean for any animation. I had not read anything that hilarious. And I just thought, this is great. I mean, my job as a director is <laughs> don't screw it up because this is really funny material. And I could see how it could be done. And I had a sense of how to portray it with a, a, a modicum of subtlety, so the jokes kind of, you know, really rang out. Um, I thought at the time, people asked me, so what do you think? And I said, well, I don't know. I, I suspected any, but any critic who enjoyed Rocky and Bullwinkle, which was kind of subversive for its time, uh, would uh, like the, this. And I knew that Fox was a, the struggling network, so they seemed to be taking chances, because even though, I mean, Tracy Owen was hilarious, and it was a, really, really a darling with critics, it never was a ratings champion, but Fox gave it a good shot. It was on for four seasons. So I figured, well, Fox will at least give it two seasons. So I was only off by, <laughs> it seems like 25 seasons. But uh, um, I would say, um, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and I thought I came up with an interesting uh, phrase that, that creativity is organic. It's not calculated. So when people sort of go back and say, well, what were you thinking? It's like, we were just thinking about what is funny and what we hadn't seen, I suppose. You know, it's like, but um, 
a lot of it was a lot of people who had never been in uh, animation before. And even to some extent, you know, Wes and myself, because we were fairly new to animation, because we were, I, I had only been out of UCLA for five years. And my uh, tastes in animation were very, and continue to be very broad. So I didn't have these sort of specific, like, oh, it has to be this way, it has to be this way, it has to be, has to be whatever way you want it to be, you know, as long as it's funny and creative. Uh, so it was all about taking, you know, chances. And maybe part of the thing that I benefited by was <laughs> lack of experience that, uh, that um, uh, you know, and I think all of us in many ways, all the, everybody was new, you know, it was Wes Archer was new, uh, Rich Moore, Jim Reardon, Brad Bird. I mean, Brad Bird uh, had a lot of, you know, uh, uh, chops from working at Disney, Disney, but he was very, you know, very uh, uh, um, uh, inventive and broad. He didn't have any sort of parameters about what it could be and could not be. And the writers certainly, um, you know, Sam worked in animation. He worked at, um, I guess, Ruby Spears or one of the one of the places like that. And he could draw as well. So, but uh, all the other writers had worked for the Tonight Tonight Show or for David Letterman or you know for Saturday Night Live or you know, <laughs> and John Schwartzwelder had actually worked you know doing doing advertise doing advertising with really crazy ads. Uh, and, uh, and from the Harvard Lampoon. So what you had is you had a mix of people who were not bound by any, shall we say, rules of what animation should be. And none of us ever thought that animation, the, the, the moniker of animation being for kids is sort of something that got straitjacketed on animation, I think, during the 60s when it became Saturday morning. But Bugs Bunny and even Mickey Mouse at the beginning was not considered, you know, for kids, it was considered for a general audience, and uh, you know certainly Bugs Bunny was on front of all these other Warner Brothers, you know, uh, tough guy <laughs> movies. So it was never meant to be a kids' medium. That was a straitjacket put on later. So uh, with that in mind, I would say it was never considered. You know, we knew we weren't doing a, we were doing an adult show. I mean, kids are certainly welcome, uh, but it was it was a, it was an adult show. It was a very interesting story because uh, we uh, started animating. Uh, started, I'm sorry, we started working on the uh, series in like April or, or May of of ninety. I'm sorry, of eighty nine, and the first episode that aired was what became the Christmas special, uh, and that was in December of eighty nine. And remember, there's no you know, merchandising or anything. We had the one special that came on. And I'd gone back east uh, where I grew up, uh, outside of D.C., in, uh, in Maryland, um, and I was at one of the, you know, shopping mall, Christmas shopping, whatever, uh, hanging out with my folks. Or... And I was wearing a Simpsons jacket, one of these sort of leather, Letterman jackets that had a big logo of the Simpsons on the back, and it had my name sort of embroidered. It was like our first gift, you know, at a, at a Christmas party. And people were yelling, hey, David. And I thought, this is some high school friend or something like that? And they said, no, no, I just, where'd you get that jacket? You know, they were all like, people were stopping me in the mall, wanting to know where they can buy this jacket. I'd hear people talking behind me, hey, did you see that Simpsons special? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. So I, I remember calling Matt Groening saying, I don't know what's going on, but I just walked around with this jacket on, and I got a ton of attention. And then sure enough, uh, when we got back the uh the premiere that was that was sort of the, the Christmas special was like this special and the premiere of the show was on January fourteenth, nineteen ninety, where which was another coincidentally another show that I did was that was the Bartha Genius Bartha Genius show, and it became a huge hit you know, and then I had gotten a call from uh, who became later became my agent David Greenblatt uh, from, uh, and he called me up saying because he had interviewed me before The Simpsons. And he said, you know, you seem very talented, but I don't know how to sell you to people. And he called me up saying, now I know how to sell you to people. <laughs> so early on, we got the, end, you know, and then it soon became a huge hit. And then, you know, all this merchandising sort of came up sort of haphazardly at first because we were completely unprepared for the, the demand. At the same time, though, we were so busy working on the show, we were kind of like, oh, really? It's a, well, that's, that's great. We're busy. You know, so we didn't really stop to smell the roses until about two years later, I'd say. At least I didn't. 
again, it's organic. Uh, I think at one point there was considered uh, early on we, were, we did an episode called Camp Krusty, and Jim Brooks started toying with the idea of maybe we should make that into a feature. And this is early on. This is about season five, I think. But that didn't happen, and then it just kind of got tabled. Um, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, I think in some respects, you know, when they were considering the feature, it had been on the air now over 10 seasons. So maybe they thought by the time <laughs> we start doing a feature, the show will be off the air or something like that. Uh, and that's another consideration. You see, do, during doing the feature was a colossal uh, undertaking in the, in the fact that we're also doing the show. And it's not like we have two teams. You know, it's the same people. And the same people, I mean, it's the same, they weren't, a, the writers that are writing on the show were being taken off the show to do like punch up on, and so forth. There's some writers who had, you know, you know, albeit had, had uh, left the show and doing other things or they were on a smaller basis on the show. So they, they, they had more time available. Uh, people like uh, David Merkin and uh, Mike Reese who had, were previous executive producers and now we're doing other things. As far as the animation, we, yes, we expanded the animation team, but still at the same time we had to utilize people who were working on the show. And that's what happened. People like working on the show were being pulled off the show to work on the feature. Um, the feature really exhausted us because uh, we were doing the show at the same time. So people often ask, well, why don't you do another one? It's like, well, because <laughs> the first one really, really took us. You know, it's not like we had this giant studio like Pixar or you know, Disney, and we, oh, we just put people on this and people on that. No, no, it's like, it's this team. So doing both the feature and 22 episodes is, it's a lot of work. I mean, it could happen again, but, you know. But I, I couldn't say specifically, because this is a decision of Jim Brooks primarily. It's, remember, Jim Brooks is Gracie Films. He has the ultimate say about this. If Jim wanted to do another feature, you know, we, we'd do it. There was some talk, this is no secret actually, there was an episode I did uh, recently that actually sat on the shelf for, for two years called uh, The Man Who Came to Be Dinner, where the Simpsons are abducted by Kay and Kodos in a non-Halloween episode. And that was considered, it was going to be broadcast uh, at the end of season, uh, well, at the end of uh, 2013, but it was put on hold, the idea of maybe should we develop this into a feature. Turned out the, the decision wasn't made not to do that. So there are, there are occasional rumblings, but, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, nothing as far as another feature. Um, as far as the shorts, um, again, I think it was, a, it was an idea of Jim's. He just sort of had this thought of doing that. Maybe he saw some of the Academy shorts and thought, well, we could do one, you know, something like that. And we had a meeting. It was me and... Uh, uh, Jim and Matt and uh, Al Jean and uh, a number of the writers like uh, uh, Joel Cohen and, and Mike Price and so on, David Merkin. And we just pitched ideas back and forth. And uh, the idea was, well, doing a silent would be great because we haven't done a lot of pantomime. We've done some pantomime, but not a whole long short of pantomime. And then, well, Maggie's the obvious choice. And uh, then we decided, well, if it's going to be Maggie, we really shouldn't see the other characters. So it should all be from her point of view. So it wasn't going to have Homer and Marge. And, uh, Marge is there, but you don't really see her face. You know what I mean? So that was one of the decisions that was made. And ideas were pitched at. And they looked at me and said, you got all that? And I said, yeah, I think so. And it was really, it was actually a lot of fun because they left it up to me to, to really kind of wrangle it and pull it together. It came out really well, and uh, we, had to, we did it pretty fast because we had a version of it. Actually, I remember we did a version of it, and then we kind of put a pin on it for about a year, and then I hadn't heard anything about it. And then uh, in March of, I guess it was 12, I think, I think it was 2012, uh, we went through it again. Again, you got all that? I think so. Could you have a board of, of that pretty quickly? And I said, well, okay, about two weeks. Can you have it done sooner? And so I did, and uh, I utilized a good half of what we had done previously and worked it out with a couple other board artists. And, um, you know, uh, actually, I remember it was actually, I presented it to Jim Brooks on um, and to Matt. Uh, I think it was actually on my birthday, March 15th. And they had no notes, which was really great. 
And uh, then we were off to the ground running, because on the ground running, uh, actually, because we had to get it in done at a certain point, because it was going to be on, in front of the, ne the next Ice Age movie. So that was, that was the intent. And it worked out. <laughs>